So thank you for being here. Uh, the, the objective of this um, uh, of this blackboard talk will be uh, quite quite pedagogical. So I will, be, uh, I will try to explain you uh, what is the object of our program from the very beginning. So uh, um, <clears throat> you will see. Okay. If you have question during the the, the, the the talk, just just ask, and I will try to replay if I know the the, the answer. So what? Our program, this is Flectro 22. This Flectro means uh, fluctuation electrodynamics. Okay, so there are these two words, fluctuation and electrodynamics. In the rest of the talk, you very soon you will understand why we have electrodynamics and fluctuation close together. So I, I will try to describe two physical effects in, in this family. One is the Casimir Lifshitz effect. Okay, I will call maybe CL effect if you want in the rest of the, of the slide. And the other will be the radiative heat transfer. Um, <clears throat> so these are the two effects I will deal with. And in principle, I will try to discuss, first of all, the vacuum. So what is vacuum and how we use vacuum and which way vacuum uh, is related to what I'm saying to, today. And so what we call virtual photon. Uh, and so on and so forth. After I will introduce, uh, uh, this will, will allow me to, to trade the Casimir Lifshitz force at t equal to zero. So this first effect at t equal to zero is related to the vacuum. And after I will introduce the thermal bath of photons, so there will be real photons. And this, uh, so real photons. It this to always at equilibrium, okay? And this will allow me to describe the Casimir Lifshitz force at uh, at finite temperature, okay? And after I will speak about uh, non-equilibrium but so non-equilibrium but And this will allow me to describe both the Casimir Lifshitz force out of equilibrium and the radiative heat transfer, which is, of course, out of equilibrium. Okay? So I will call this radiative heat transfer like that, radiative heat transfer. Okay? So this is the program, vacuum, after we introduce some photons in a thermal bath, and after two thermal baths. Okay? So let's start, with, let's start with, with the concept of vacuum. <laughs> So what is vacuum, okay? The Greeks, they call it vacuum with a nice word, which is to canon. So it's written in this way. No, it's, this is new, so it's, it's something like that. Huh? To canon. To canon means empty, empty space. So for Greeks, for Aristotle, and so on and so forth, for philosophers that they started thinking about vacuum several thousand years ago, vacuum was just something with nothing inside. Okay? Uh, after some, some uh, thousand uh, years later, we have quantum field theory. Okay? So it's a small jump. And in quantum field theory, vacuum starts to be something different. Okay? Most of you know what is vacuum in quantum field theory. I just will repeat something that you already know. If you do not know, you will learn something. So if you take just a box, okay, in your box, you don't care what is outside. Suppose that you have an ideal box, and you can have your photons, you can have your gluons, I don't know, you can have your electrons, and whatever you want. Now you can say, okay, I start, to, or your molecules, I can start to eliminate photons, okay, in some way. I eliminate gluons, I eliminate electrons. 
So what remain inside? This is the question, okay? What remain inside is what we call the quantum vacuum, or the vacuum. So in quantum field theory, uh, the naive or very simple way to describe the physics is not in, in terms of particles, as you know, but in terms of fields. And so you can imagine that your space is filled with fields, with fields of different kind, a field for electron, a field for, the, for photons, a field for any particle that you know. And the description of these fields are like harmonic oscillators. So you can think that in space you have some sort of mass which is related to, uh, to a spring and another mass and another spring and so on and so forth. Okay? So this very easy description in classical physics is used in quantum field theory to describe the fields. Okay? And so uh, if you have uh, coupled harmonic oscillators, you know the, the potential for an oscillator is like that, it's a parabolic potential. And you know that in classical physics, you can do whatever you want. You can have a particle which is at rest here, zero velocity and position fixed, or at any energy you want in this potential. But you know that in quantum physics, when you have these oscillators, you have quantized mode. So you have mode like this. The first one, which is an energy which is one half h bar omega. The second one, which is h bar omega plus one half h bar omega, and so on and so forth. So this is the quantum harmonic oscillator. And this is the classical. And so the fact that you have a quantization of energy levels in this quantum field theory changes everything with respect to the classical physics. Because you have not only these uh, steps here, but you have also this one. And this one is not zero. It's never zero. It's one half h bar omega. So uh, this is also related to the Eisenberg indetermination principle. Because if you draw, the, if you take a particle of mass n when you are in the first studies of physics, you see that uh, the ground state is a Gaussian. Okay? And so the particle is delocalized, cannot be in a given point, with zero velocity and, 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 and fixed position. It's delocalized, so the Fourier transform of this is again a Gaussian. So input, um, quantity of movement and uh, um, position, okay, uh, they, they should uh, respect some relation. They cannot be zero both at the same time. Okay? So the, indetermination, the, the Eisenberg indetermination is included for free, if you want, in this ground state. Okay? Uh, now, uh, what I will use often here is, uh, I'm speaking to people who is not for, comes not from, from physics, is the uh, expectation value of some quantities. So suppose that you have an observable or an operator. Okay? You want to calculate the expectation value on some state. Okay, this collection of this system here, which is uh, just fulfill all the space, Okay, is a collection of these oscillators. Real particles are just excitation of this system. You can, see, you can think to this excitation of this uh, ensemble of masses. And if they are all in the ground state, okay, all these are in the ground state, you call this the vacuum state. Okay, zero is the vacuum state. And all these oscillators are at zero in the lowest energy state. And you can try to calculate quantities so average values or expectation values of some observable O uh, uh, between, uh, it's not good to call O, there are too many zero here, it's called A, okay? And this is the expectation value of an operator in the vacuum state, okay? Again, this vacuum state means that they are all these oscillators are on this one half h bar omega energy state. Uh, you can have some case in, in which this is zero. Typically, for the electromagnetic field, always you have quantity which are zero. But you can have some situation in which the, the, uh, this quantity, I don't know, some square of this operator is not zero. Okay? You can have situation like that. So the zero point energy is zero, but not the fluctuation of these quantities. Okay? And this is exactly what happens for the electromagnetic field as instance. Okay? This is good, because if for the electromagnetic field we have that this is not zero, it would be a problem. Because since it's a vectorial field, this means that in the universe we will, we will have a preferred direction. Okay? So it's good that this quantity is not zero for the electromagnetic field. For the Higgs field, it's, it's not zero, but there is no problem because it's a scalar field. Okay? We are lucky. But for the electromagnetic field, the square this quantity here, the average value of a square, 
is different from zero, okay? And this will give rise to the effect I'm going to discuss, which is this Casimir effect. So we call this the fluctuations, okay? When the square, the average value of the square is non-zero. So these are what we call fluctuations. So if you now consider all these oscillators, you have one, one half h bar omega for all possible omega you want, in real omega, from zero to infinite. So if you take the energy of the electromagnetic field, which is proportional to the square of the electric field, okay, so E is the electric field, uh, if you take the, this quantity here, or EE if you want, this quantity here in, in vacuum space, this not only is non-zero, but if you sum up over, over frequencies, it's infinite, okay? So this is the average value of your Hamiltonian, okay? And you have that this is the integral from zero to infinite of one half h bar omega, the omega, and this is infinite, okay? So this is, of course, raise some problems uh, for, for, okay? <clears throat> But okay, it's infinite. So sometimes when we have infinite, uh, we do not worry so much because there is always some way to how to renormalize things and so on and so forth, and we can get rid of this infinite. Uh, now, uh, I should say that with, with any one of these omega, so if you think to the electromagnetic field, so to the waves, you have also lambda, okay, which goes like one over omega. So this means that you have all possible fluctuation at all wavelengths. There is no limitation from lambda equal to zero to lambda equal to the size of the universe, okay? Uh, now, the, the idea of the Casimir effect is the following. Okay, I have something which is infinite, but... Uh, <clears throat> what happens if I insert boundary in my space? I do not have the, uh, only the entire universe, but I set some boundaries. And if I set some boundary, in particular, we can start with ideal boundaries, so boundaries which uh, are perfectly reflecting, okay? So if you take boundaries, okay, so what I'm saying now for the electromagnetic field, of course, you, there is no reason why it should not be the same for any kind of field, for electron field, for Higgs field, for t whatever you want, okay? If you are able to fix boundary for this field, you will have some Casimir effect, okay? So I'm speaking now about only the electromagnetic field, but keep in mind that this will happen with any field. Okay? Of course, it will be more tricky to find the boundaries, perfectly boundaries for particles which has very, very high energies because the, the wavelength will be very small, so you cannot stop the particle. Okay? But for the electromagnetic field, you can think of that. So suppose that you have two perfect mirrors, hmm? like this, which are separated by distance d. So this is a perfect mirror. And this is what did Casimir himself in 1948, something like that. So Casimir, 48. Okay. Now what happens? And since you have these cavities, of course you cannot have inside the, the electromagnetic with the one, one half h bar omega that you have for any omega. Here you cannot have for any omega because you should respect these boundaries. So you will have this, let's call this lambda one. You will have this. Let's call this lambda 2, and so on and so forth. So you can have lambda inside, you can have something which is lambda n, which goes like, I don't remember, something 2 uh, d divided n, okay? And this is discrete. It's still infinite. You have still an infinite number because n is a natural number. You have an infinite num possibility of wavelength, but they are discrete, okay? What happens outside? Outside, you, there is no problem. Outside, you, you, you can have exactly the same lambda 1, okay? And you can have also exactly the same lambda 2, of course. There is no problem with that. And with all lambda you want. But outside, you can also have a lambda between the two. So you can have whatever lambda in continuous range. So you have an infinite quantity outside, which is this integral here, okay? Let's call this quantity the um, energy uh, out, okay? This energy out is infinite. This sum over all the modes. And the energy in, 
which depends on d. Why it depends on d? Because it depends on the wavelength, and the wavelength is the sum depends on d, which is this some sort of sum over n of one half h bar omega n. This is to infinite. It's also infinite. In omega n, there is the dependence on d. Eh? And it's also infinite. And now the tricky part is that, OK, you have two infinites, but what happens if you do the difference between these two infinites? Hmm? Uh, it happens that the difference between these two infinites is finite. So uh, if you define the derivative, OK, you can have an energy, which is, I will call it Casimir energy, which is the difference between the, the E out minus the E in, which depends on D. And this Casimir energy will depend on D2. And this is finite. OK? <clears throat> so if you calculate uh, minus the derivative with respect to D of this E Casimir, you will have something which is a force, which is the Casimir force. And this Casimir force, for Per, per unit of area, OK? Uh, so I will call this force or, or pressure. It depends. So I wrote in my, I wrote this pressure, OK? So let's write this pressure. So it's the force per unit of area. Is, this is the calculation. But if you look at the original Casimir paper, this difference is done in half a page. So the paper is very short. It's, it's done, OK? And is minus h bar c p square divided 240 d power 4. So I just uh, want to just square this so that in red, because it's the, uh, it's the reason why we are all today here, so it's an important equation, is minus h bar c p square 240 d, d four, power 4. So you can see that, first of all, is attractive for two uh, perfect plates. This minus sign tells you this, you have attraction. Is quantum. It is relativistic, because there is C. If you put C to zero, there is, you cannot have this force. And scales uh, very rapidly with distance, with separation. Okay? So keep in mind this equation. I don't know if you have already a question about this. But what always uh, uh, okay, I, I studied this effort since maybe more than 20 years. And so what, what, what was very interesting for me is that uh, uh, this effect, uh, like this, has some particular properties with, which is not so common in other physical effects. The first interesting point is this is quantum. At the same time, is relativistic. And, and up to here, OK, there are a lot of phenomena which are quantum and relativistic, OK? But the other point is, is this is macroscopic. And there are not so many phenomena which are macroscopic, quantum, and relativistic, OK? There are macro phenomena which are quantum and microscopic, like superconductivity, uh, OK? But which are quantum, relativistic, and macroscopic, there are not so many phenomena. And when I say macroscopic, I mean really macroscopic, OK? So let's give an estimation of this expression here, just to have numbers, OK? So if you consider two perfect, two perfect, I'm, I'm not able to, to draw in 3D, but I will try. If you have two perfect mirrors like that, which have one millimeter uh, sides, this is always one millimeter. And here, the separation between these two, so D is 10 nanometer. Okay. The Casimir force is of the order of 0 0.1 Newton. So it's not small. 0 0.1 Newton. And this force is entirely, entirely quantum. It's the macroscopic manifestation of the presence of the zero point energy for the electromagnetic field. So there is quantum, which you can never see with your eyes, which gives you a macroscopic effect, OK? The quantum field. Is the other way around of the Higgs fields, in which you, you, it's very hard to see Higgs particles, but it's very easy to see the effect of the non-zero value, of the expectation value of the Higgs field, because it's what gives rise to the masses. 
So it's the other way around of the Casimir effect. In the Casimir effect, you see photons, so real particles, every day. In the vacuum, it's quite complicated to see it. it. Okay? Uh, no, no, okay. I, this is, uh, I, I draw this, but uh, I imagine infinite, okay? This is the force uh, per unit of area, or if you, okay, see? If the, if the plates are very close, okay, boundary effects are not so important. If you have plates of, which are separated by one nanometer, and the size is one millimeter, this is like infinite plates, okay? Under all practical point of view, okay? Of course, in finite size system, uh, you have to pay attention, okay? I'm considering just the ideal case, okay? But of course, also this can never be perfectly reflecting, so you have to take into account the real properties of the boundaries and the real shape. So I, in the first uh, part of my talk, I'm just thinking about uh, ideal case, the Casimir stuff, and after I will write the real stuff. The, so Casimir did this, it's a calculation in two pages, but if you do the calculation in the real stuff, is um, Depends how you do the calculation, it can be tens of pages, okay? If you, if you follow what other people, what Lifshitz did or Pitayeski did in the, at the beginning. No, you can also do very rapidly. Maybe I will show you how to do, but. So, it's, it's quantum, it's relativistic, it's macroscopic, and it's an effect of, a quant of, of the zero point energy, of, this, of the fact that in this parabola, you, can, you, are, real, you are really quantized state, okay? So, um, now the question is, okay, thank you, so far, I, I, I will go directly to the point. Okay, this is very nice, it's ideal, okay, but what happens in real life, okay? So, first question, what happens for real material? Okay, which are not, does not exist a perfectly boundary like that, okay? You can have superconductors, but in general, you, you, you cannot have perfectly uh, uh, ideal plates, okay? The other point is, okay, all this is at zero temperature, but what happens in real life? You can never stay at zero temperature. So what, what is the effect of temperature? Okay? Okay, and so this problem has been solved. It's been solved almost 10 years later uh, in 56 by Lifshitz. So, uh, this paper by Lifshitz, is, he did a lot of wonderful things, but I think that this paper is one of the pillar and the most beautiful paper he did in his life, okay? I, I, if you read all this, it's wonderful, he did a lot of things, but what he did here was really wonderful, and you will understand why. You know that in, in, in uh, <clears throat> uh, also in biology, you know these Van der Waals forces, okay? There are three kinds of Van der Waals forces. There is one kind of Van der Waals forces, which is the force which happens between polarizable molecules, okay? Not charged, but simply polarizable modules. So I will call this dispersion. So these are Van der Waals forces. So you have dispersion forces. This is the number one. And here what is enough is to have polarizable molecule, to something which has a, a polarizability alpha different from zero. And since D is equal to alpha E, if you have fluctuating fields, you have fluctuating dipole, and so on and so forth, okay? After you have another kind of Van der Waals forces, which are for, this, so these molecules are molecules which have polarizability, but they have no permanent dipole, okay? But after you can have molecules that have permanent dipoles, and so you have another kind of, of Van der Waals forces, which is called orientation forces. These orientation forces is something, uh, uh, they are also called the Kism force, and are due to a permanent dipole. He is fluctuating, this is fluctuating dipole. Because it's a dipole induced by the electric field, and this is permanent dipole. And after you have a third kind of Van der Waals forces, which are the induction forces. And these are also called the Debye forces. 
And these are due to the interaction between dipole and quadrupole. So if you have a permanent dipole or a permanent quadrupole, they can induce dipole and so on and so forth. And you have this induction force. So what did Lifshitz, what did the, he um, derived the general theory of this kind of Van der Waals forces, so in a paper which is called a general theory of Van der Waals forces, in which all regime of Van der Waals forces, which are always in dispersion forces, are included. And inside these Van der Waals forces, in a magic way, you find the Casimir effect included in. So the Casimir effect is, is nothing more than the Van der Waals forces. Okay? So it's a force which acts between dipoles, fluctuating dipoles. Okay? Just try to think in this way. So you can think for ideal metals like Casimir did, there is this story of Im unbalancing between waves inside and outside, but in real life, these are Van der Waals forces, these are dipoles which talk. Okay? So if you have this physical explanation in mind, you can, we will be able to follow a lot of details I will give you in the following, which cannot be grasped by simply this ideal picture of ideal reflectors, of ideal metals. <clears throat> so I will take the, there's not so many white. <clears throat> so the idea used by Lifshitz to calculate this force is the following, okay? Is to use uh, the Maxwell stress tensor. The Maxwell stress tensor is a quantity such that the flux of this quantity across a surface gives you the momentum transmitted to the object which are inside this surface. This is the Maxwell stress tensor. So this is a quantity which is proportional to the square of the electric field or the square of the magnetic field. There are also squares of something, of B or E. So the force, which I call it now Casimir Lifshitz, because this is really the force that we have in nature, so we should give credit to Lifshitz, this force can be calculated like the integral over some surface of the average value of the Maxwell stress tensor, which is this, this is Maxwell stress tensor, times uh, scalar product with the surface. So if you have an object here, I don't know, something like this, you can consider a surface around this object, the surface sigma, so you we have the normal, this is, uh, you can call this day sigma, and this is the T, okay? And if you do the, the scalar product and you calculate the flux of this, you will have this quantity. This is the idea. Hmm? So if you want the average value of this Maxwell stress tensor, you will need to have access to the average value of the EE or BD, which, as you know, at T equal to zero is not zero. Okay, is what I told you at the beginning. So, uh, <coughs> if you do the calculation, you will need at some point to calculate quantities, so uh, zero point expectation value of the square of the fields. So, you will need to calculate something which is EE, average value, over some state which can be zero temperature or a thermal state, whatever you want. So, I will put thermal here or zero, whatever I put, Okay, I do not write anything. This can be done whenever you want, okay? So if you want this quantity, it's very complicated in general to calculate. But luckily, we know that the thermal equilibrium there is a very powerful theorem which allows you has to have this, which is the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Fluctuation dissipation theorem, okay? This is Kubo and, and others. So this fluctuation dissipation theorem says that these quantities is equal to two, I will write in a different way, I will write in four pi, one half h bar, um, there is an omega here, no, I will write in, no, no, I will write as I was before, so, 2 pi h bar, hyperbolic cotangent of h bar omega divided 2 times chi Boltzmann t, times the imaginary part of the Green function, 
of the system, okay, times a delta function in frequency. These are in the omega space, okay? You have R and omega here, okay? I, I will not write all ingredients inside, otherwise there will be two. This E here is something which depends on R and on omega, okay? Is the Fourier transform in time and also this, okay? I will work also in omega representation, okay? This will be E R prime omega prime, okay? And so you will have also here in this green function, R prime, R, omega, omega prime, and so on. I will not repeat all this, otherwise we will become crazy, but, okay. Of course, yes, yes, this, uh, you have this, you have E, G. I'm saying I'm not rewriting all the other ones, we'll become crazy, okay? Here you have E, G, omega, and so on and so forth, okay? Of course, it's a, ve it's a vector of the electric field, okay? You agree with me? But I will write in this way just for us, okay? Do not tell to anyone. So why this, this theorem is magic is, is, is magic because what is this hyperbolic cotangent? If you develop this hyperbolic cotangent, you have a 1 plus 2 divided the exponential of h bar omega divided k Boltzmann t minus 1. And if you multiply by 1 half h bar omega this, okay, You have the first term here that I circle in red, which are the vacuum fluctuations. And after you have the second term here, which are the thermal fluctuations, which are semi-classical. They contain H bar, but they're semi-classical, okay? It's the Planck spectrum. So these theorems, which is valid, I repeat, only at thermal equilibrium. I stress this because after I will use this also, I will explain to you what happens out of thermal equilibrium. So this, uh, um, this theorem can, allows us to uh, have both the behavior of both quantum and vacuum fluctuations. So now, now that you know this average value, you can put inside this T, and this T you can put inside this formula, and you can calculate the Lipschitz expression. Okay, the Lipschitz or the Casimir Lipschitz first. So let me do it. <clears throat> so I will give you. Um, flavor of what is this, for instance, um, okay, I will write this in real frequency before. So how it look like this? If you take uh, real material at finite temperature, which can be zero or not, okay, the Casimir expression is something like that. I will write already rotated on the complex plane. It's something like that. So the pressure for two slabs like this, okay? This is the separation D. You have the object one and the object two, and everything is at the same temperature T, okay? So this P Casimir Lipschitz can be written like minus K Boltzmann T divided P, sum over N, which goes from 1 to infinite prime, the integral between 0 and infinite, the Q, Q, small Q, Z, I call this Q, Z, sum over polarizations of R of the first object P, R of the second object P, I will explain after what all is all this, minus 2 times this Q, Z, D, divided 1 minus the exponential of minus 2 qzd rp1 rp2. Okay. Sorry, uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, long. And so this qz is simply the projection of the photon wave vector in the direction z. Let's call this z. Okay. So it is... Uh, uh, the frequency divided C square minus uh, Q square. And this C, which is the Matsubara frequency, I will tell you where it comes from, is 2 pi P N K Boltzmann T over H bar. So I will say you what happens here. First of all, you cannot put the zero directly here. They say, okay, but this force is zero, zero temperature, because there is also temperature in all this function here. Okay, so I prevent this because the first question that the students say, you cannot put zero from the very beginning, okay? You have to pay attention here. So what you have here, you have this R, 
are the reflection coefficients of the two bodies, are simply the Fresnel reflection coefficients of classical physics, the one that you start, you know, you have a, a field, a wave impinging one, uh, one slab, what is the amplitude of the reflected field, the ratio between the incident and the reflected is this, this one. And of course, depends on the polarization because you can have two polarization for light. So you have to sum up the two, two polarization. And after here in the denominator, you see that you have the fabri perot oscillation. You have the electromagnetic field, the photons, which go uh, in one direction and the other in this cavity. So these are the oscillations okay, in the cavity. This Q is the projection of the photon wave vector along the plane, okay, along this plane here. So you integrate on all the wave vector and on all the frequencies. Here, the integration over frequencies becomes a sum because um, Lifshitz used a district to do the rotation on the complex omega plane, instead to do the integral, or of course the first derivation, instead to have this sum like this, you have the integral over the omega and everything is on real frequency, okay? But if you do this, this exponential here, for propagating wave, they oscillate like crazy. And so he, he, since this, uh, the imaginary, the green function plays the roles of the response function in linear response theory is analytic in the, after, uh, af, uh, in the upper half plane. And since it's analytical in the upper half plane, you can do this rotation. And you can see that when you integrate, since if you have to integrate over real omega, this integral, if you do something like that, this is i omega, okay, you can close this contour. And you will have that here is analytical, there is no problem. The integral over this line is zero if this part goes to infinite. And you can also show that the integral over this flat part is zero. And you here you have your poles, and so you have to calculate the, uh, this part of integral around the poles. And the position of these poles, which are the Matsubara frequency, are exact, exactly this Xn. So the n which is here, you have n equal 0 for this pole, n equal 1 for this, and so on and so forth. And so when you do this rotation, since you passed omega becomes i omega, i plus i is minus, and so you have exponential wave and no more propagating waves. And so it's much more easy to calculate this expression or image on it. But pay attention, you can do this only at thermal equilibrium, because the green function is analytical in the upper half plane. Out of equilibrium, you cannot do that, okay? So uh, maybe all the ingredients are clear here, uh, and I will explain why this complicated expression, uh, of course, the, in these reflection coefficients, what are the ingredients? You have the epsilon of the material, the dielectric functions, okay, which depends on frequency and can depends also on the wave vectors if it is non-local. Okay? So you have to put your epsilon inside, you calculate r, and when you have the r, you calculate this double integral, integral and sum, and you have for magic, this van der Waals, generalized van der Waals forces, which is valid from few nanometers up to infinite. Separation, okay? I say few nanometers, not zero, because it's a macroscopic effect. When the two bodies start, start to overlap, they will function, uh, you cannot separate them, so you cannot use this expression, okay? So this is valid when the overlap between the wave function of the two bodies do not, uh, is zero. Okay? So what is, uh, uh, what is, Maybe I'm too slow, so I accelerate. If you have questions, please uh, ask. So <clears throat> what is nice is this. I will plot you the result of this integral here. So here you have distance. And here you have the casimir lifshitz expression. Okay? And I will plot this in a logarithmic way. Log, log, so you have log. 10 and log 10 of this, so that you, you can span more order of magnitude. So the first thing you have is this, is this line here, okay? And I will plot, okay, I will plot this, okay, I will plot this times d cube, okay? Why d cube? Because if I have a, a, an horizontal line, this means that this is a line which goes like 1 over d cube. And this one is the Van der Waals London expression that you know from first year of study, which goes like 1 over d cube. It's the Van der Waals London between two macroscopic objects. It is quantum, contains h bar here, but is non-relativistic, contains no c. So it's the non-relativistic Van der Waals part. 
After you have another line, I will put this in uh, orange, which goes like this. This is the Casimir limit, okay? Which goes like one over D4. It's the one that I circled here at some point, okay? It's the Casimir one. But the Casimir one, not for ideal metal. It's really the Casimir one for real metal. Still, you have one over D4. You have C here, so it's relativistic. You have H bar, is quantum, okay? Uh, uh, but it's for real matter. So the prefactor that you have here is not simply pi squared divided uh, 240. It's the real one which comes from integration and can be derived as a limiting case of the Lifshitz force. So even when you are in this regime, you can never use the Casimir expression. You have to use the Lifshitz one, okay? And after you have another uh, asympt asymptotic limit, which is this one in violet, and then we call this the Lifshitz, F Lifshitz, because it's the thermal part. This is the, <clears throat> it's, it's a quantity which goes like temperature divided D3 again. So you have 1 over D3, 1 over D4, 1 over D3 again. And these are only asymptotic limits. And where are, where are the crossing between this line? This crossing here, it appears here. So I will call this optical wavelength. And this crossing here, is here, and I will call this thermal wavelength. This thermal wavelength is h bar c divided k Boltzmann t, the, the one that you know, and at room temperature is 7 micron, is the infrared. So this is infrared. Okay? This quantity here is the optical, it comes from an interplay between the dielectric function of the two bodies. Because what happens? I, I told you before that you can see this as two dipoles or dipoles in these bodies which talk each other. So suppose that you have two, two dipoles, okay? And they fluctuate. And you put they, they very close. They fluctuate very rapidly. So the time that they exchange the information is very short with respect to the time that light needs to go from one to the other. So you are in the non-retarded regime. So you are in this green Van der Waals London regime, okay? And these dipoles that fluctuate, they try to minimize energy. And to minimize energy, they try to have to spend the most of their time in the opposition. And if they are opposed, to minimize the energy, they attract. So this is the Casimir force. The dipole fluctuates, they talk each other, they prefer to stay opposite in, in direction, and so they attract to minimize the energy. Of course, this effect is strongly non-additive, because if you have a third dipole here, which fluctuates, and, and the two which are here, the way in which they interact is strongly affected by the third one. So the Casimir effect is not additive. You have really to do this big, calculation, you cannot simply do a pairwise summation of dipolar force. You cannot do that, hmm? apart from some, some limiting case. Now, if the two dipoles are far, the time that the photon hmm, takes to go from one to the other, this is compared with the speed of light, uh, the time of the light to go. And so you have to include the retardation effect. And if you are at farther distances or higher temperature, you have the thermal effect, which are this violet line. So look, when the temperature T is very low, this crossing point moves in this direction. And so you have practically only the... So if, if I plot just the force, this one at zero temperature, I will never see this loop here. I will have something like that, like the yellow one, which is like that. So this one is the casimir lifshitz force at T equals zero. If I plot the one at finite temperature T, I will have something like that. I have no more colors. I will use the, the, the blue one. I never use the blue. So the one will be like that. And here we start doing like that to reach the thermal part. So this is a T different from zero. Now, first remark. To have thermal effect, you have to be very far or at very high temperature. And if you are very far, the effect, since decayed like 1 over D4, is very, very t tiny, okay? Second remark, the slope here is never 1 over D4, never, because it crossed this point. So maybe it's some, maybe in one point is 1 over D4, so you can, okay? But it's never 1 over D4. So people, when they measure the Casimir effect, then, strictly speaking, they will never have 1 over D4, okay? Never. Because this is just an asymptotic limit. And typically, this quantity here is of the order of 10 nanometer or 100 nanometer. 
So this is 100 nanometer, this is 10 microns. They are very far, okay? And the experiments are all done between 50 nanometers and 150 nanometers with microscopic objects. So people typically measure this regime here, okay? Or a little bit this, it depends on the experiment, okay? So if you use in this regime the Van der Waals or the Casimir limit, you will never got, strictly speaking, the good result. Because these are just asymptotic limits. What you measure is here. You have not a real power law. OK, so so you see in which way the Lipschitz theory encompasses all the regime. The small distance, Van der Waals, what you know in biology, the average distance, which is the Casimir polder, and the large distance, which is the thermal one, the Lipschitz one. Okay? Uh, if you uh, trace this for, of course, I consider it just slab slab, but as you can imagine, all these power law changes if you have atom slab or two atoms or a sphere in front of a slab or a cyl cylinder in front of another cylinder. So the geometry of the bodies affects this shape, the power law, everything. Okay. So if you have uh, slab slab, you have something which is one over d three, one over d four. T over D3, okay? This is lambda opt, this is thermal length. If you have surface atom, if you have an atom, the power law are like that. One over D4, one over D3, and one over D4 proportional in temperature. So this part is proportional to temperature, okay? And so if you have other configuration, you will have other power law, okay? Now, uh, these dispersion forces are ubiquitous because all object, all object contains a, 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 a linear response to electromagnetic field. Okay, there are no objects which, which do not uh, respond to an electromagnetic field. So, whatever you have an object which is polarizable, which has a polarizability different from zero, you will have this. So, this is why they are universal and, and ubiquitous. Now. Uh, which are, as I told you, at the origin of this force, you have the, the dipoles, okay? You have dipoles, so if you look at an object, you can think of the currents, electronic currents or ionic currents which, which are in your system. They move, they fluctuate, and they talk each other between the two bodies. They correlate in some way, and they give rise to this force. So at the origin of this, you have sources which are oscillating sources. So if you consider, for instance, a body here, with some currents, I don't know, a lot of currents of electrons that moves all around at finite temperature and also at zero temperature, you can write the, electro, the electric field outside this body here. If you, at the position R, you want the electric field, you can write this as the convolution of the polarization field or the current, if you want, or I can call this J. There is some coefficient here, do not care. J times the green function integrating in the volume V1, V1, where this is the object one. Of course, this is a vector. I should put something like this. Okay, I, okay, okay. But you understand. If you do the convolution between the currents and the green function, you have the field. Okay. So look, I have a single body here. If you want, um, if you want something which is EE. Average value, which is what I need to calculate the Casimir force, but only due to this object, okay? Not to the other object or to the environment. I'm just considering the sources here. Consider that in the rest there are no sources for the moment, okay? Only here there are sources. So I have to integrate over the sources in the volume V1. And if I need this kind of correlation of the electric field at this position outside the body, okay, due to the object one, I put one here, okay? This is what, and look, I use this twice. So it is the double integral of, of GG, average value, because you have an average value here, times GG, which are the two green function, integrated twice over the volume, okay? But you have the fluctuation dissipation theorem also for the currents. 
And this fluctuation dissipation theorem for the currents, look, now I'm considering only this body. So I'm not considering that the, what is going outside is at the same temperature of this. I'm saying nothing about outside. Outside you can have another temperature, you can have another object, you can. And you have simply to add this effect if you want. But at the moment, I'm simply, simply considering this object, okay? And so this is why I cannot use the fluctuation dissipation theorem, the one for EE, the general one, because that one needs a full equilibrium. So it needs that everywhere you have to have field which are in equilibrium with matter, matter with matter, field with field, a really full equilibrium. Now I'm just considering equilibrium locally inside this body. So this is locally a thermal equilibrium. Okay? And so the, the, the correlation function GG the fluctuation dissipation theorem is something like that, okay? Again, I skip all indices, but what is important is that when you have the imaginary part of the dielectric function of the body one, times, the, again, the hyperbolic cotangent of h bar omega divided q Boltzmann t divided chu, and so on and so forth, is local in frequency, is local in space, and so on and so forth. But what is important is this. You have the imaginary part of epsilon, okay? And you have again the hyperbolic cotangent, and in the, in the, inside this hyperbolic cotangent you have fluctuation, vacuum fluctuation, plus thermal fluctuation again. So now, if you, have, if you are in a situation which is out of thermal equilibrium, in which you have not one object, but you have two objects, each one at a given temperature, different from the other, what you have to do is simply to, to calculate the total fluctuation, and the total one will be simply the sum of the two, okay? Because they are not correlated. The, the waves, in principle, okay? Uh, in, uh, okay? In the, 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 in the ideal case we are considering, which in practice, under all practical purposes, works very well, is that when you have waves which impinge from one object to the other, does not correlate the two dipoles, okay? Does not affect the correlation between the two. They are local, so you have two bodies, one at temperature T, one, and one at temperature T2, this temperature T1 and T2 is fixed by external reservoir. So you have a reservoir which fixes this. Never in time T1 and T2 will vary, never. It will be fixed to T1, whatever is the separation between the two. Okay? And so this, you have the sum of EE of the object 1 plus EE of the object 2. This will contain the uh, hyperbolic cotangent of H bar omega 2 bar T1, and this will contain the 1 at T2, okay? Here you cannot do the rotation on the complex plane because the function is not analytical. You have really to work with the real frequency, which is a mess, okay? But this can be done, okay? It, it is usually done. But the physics behind is this, so I... Uh, it's not automatically... Okay? The physics behind is this. You have locally that the currents can be described by this fluctuation dissipation theorem at the temperature T1. Okay. So now, if you want to calculate the, the Casimir forcing system out of thermal equilibrium, you are simply to use this. You plug this in the flux of the stress tensor, and you have Casimir force out of equilibrium. The funny thing with Casimir force out of equilibrium is that it's not does not come from a, a potential. You cannot derive like the derivative minus the derivative of potential, okay? Okay, the, the, the work depends on the trajectory. Okay, so you can calculate the force, but there is no potential for that. The other funny thing is that, okay, you have two systems at two temperature. Of course you will have, of course. Okay, you will have this vacuum part is always at thermal equilibrium, okay? The thermal part, which is the second part, which is contained here, can be at two different temperatures. Okay, so you can have, a, you will have appearing some difference between the two Bose factor. But, of course, if you have two objects out of thermal equilibrium, not only you will have an exchange of, of momentum, you will have also an exchange of energy. Because you can have another quantity, which is the pointing vector, which is proportional to E cross B. And if you calculate the flux of the average value of this pointing vector across the surface, you will have the heat exchange between the two bodies. But look, this pointing vector contains E and B, but in vacuum, B is simply related to E in a trivial way. So at the end of the story, this average value contains quantity which are EE. But we know how to deal with the EE. 
Because the EE which comes from the left body, we calculate in this way, and the EE which comes from the right body, we calculate in the other way. And so the E transfer, which is this, can be calculated exactly with the same strategy that I told you for the Casimir effect out of thermal equilibrium. And this has been done by Polder and Van Hove in the 60s. Okay, something like that. Okay. So, what happens to the... This is what, I, is what is called the radiative heat transfer, and this is the other part of the, sorry, of the, all time I have, five minutes, of, of our program. And so what is the, the physics of this radiative heat transfer? Um, the expression, so now you understand how we derived, and the expression is something like that, this H, will be again an integral over frequency and an integral over wave vectors, you will have the difference between the two Bose factor, T1 minus 1, and the same exponential h bar omega, K Boseman, T2 minus 1, with a minus, and here you have a function here, which again depends on the reflection coefficient, R1 and R2, exactly like in the Casimir force. This is why this program is based on a common ground. Okay, you see now. Everything, but this, of course, is purely thermal because the quantum for so the, the zero point energy here is cancelled in this difference. You have one half minus one half. So uh, zero temperature, L, the, the quantum part is always at thermal equilibrium at zero temperature. Okay? So in this heat transfer, only the thermal part is important, of course. Now, uh, when you do this double integral, okay. The Casimir effect is a broad range effect. You have to integrate of all frequencies. And uh, when you do the integral, here you need very, very broad uh, windows of integration in frequency. Let's, let's look at this heat transfer. The heat transfer behavior is like that. It's more monochromatic. So I will do like that. Uh, I'll use this. <clears throat> so in this expression here of F, you will have something which is the imaginary part of epsilon 1 times the imaginary part of epsilon 2. You have the product of two imaginary parts of the epsilon. So this means that if epsilon like delta Dirac at some frequency, if they are not at the same point, when you do the integral, you have zero. So it is important for the heat transfer to have identical material, or very similar material with overlapping uh, epsilon, okay? This is the first point. The second point is that you have this function here. And this function is, is centered at lambda t, which is in the infrared. So you have to have material which has epsilon, which are very close, and at the position of the infrared, if you want to increase this integral. So uh, if you look at the dispersion relation, okay, take two bodies like that, you will have this body at T1, this body at T2, and you will have propagative waves which will arrive from this body to this one, okay? And these propagative waves, if the objects are very far, gives you simply the, the, the black body uh, power, the, which is T4. So let's write something. This one is the power, which goes like T41 minus T42, okay? With the Stefan Boltzmann in front of it. Now, if they become close, these are only propagative waves. If they are close, what happens? Inside this object, you have currents. These currents uh, radiate light. But you have also the angle of total reflection. So if these dipoles are here in this region, when they arrive here, they are totally reflected. And so they produce an evanescent wave on the other side. And so the same here, you have evanescent wave. In the two evanescent waves, if this distance is hundreds or tens of nanometers, is below 10 micro, they start to talk. So you have not only propagating wave, which is the black, black body limit, but you have the near field effect, which is related to the tunneling of the evanescent wave. And if you have also surface mode here, because your object contains surface plasma and polariton, or surface phonon and polariton, you have other kind of evanescent wave which couples, which are very monochromatic. So if you, you the behavior here of the transfers goes like that. At large separation, when large is larger than the thermal wavelength, you recover the black body. But after the increase in this way, this is logarithmic. It goes like 1 over d square. So in the near field, the transfer increased dramatically due to the tunneling of these photons. Okay? So uh, in the Casimir effect, to increase the effect, you want that the photons go and back inside several times. 
So you want object not identical, because if they are too much identical, it will, and it, it will be absorbed rapidly. Here, you want that they are identical because you want that the photon be absorbed to increase the heat transfer, okay? So, now I, I finish, but if you have questions during your question, maybe I can try to tell you which are now the main directions in this field, uh, playing on the materials, on the geometries, and so on and so forth. But this is the basics, okay? Yeah, typically the experiment are done between few nanometers, 10 or maybe there are experiments at 3, 4 nanometers, okay? Even below nanometer, up to 100 nanometers. So they are all in this region here, the experiment. At large distances, you, you do not see so much. You, you have not, okay? So the, the region is between, uh, this D is between, uh, let's say, 1 nanometer and uh, 100 or few hundred nanometers. And of course, the material is important. If you have metals, metals, they have the plasma frequency, which is in the ultraviolet. It's not in the infrared. So it's not good metals for heat transfer. This, uh, what is good are polar materials, because polar materials like SEC, they have resonance is exactly 10 microns. But there is a tricky way about metals, is that uh, if you have two metal objects, and you nanostructure this in a periodic wave, way, so you have a grating, okay? With metals, you can create modes inside this. And these modes here, which are called the, the spoof plasmas, they have frequency n, which goes like 1 over n. So, 1 over h, sorry. h is this 8 here. So, if you have grating 8 enough, you can have a frequency which is goes down from the, infra, from the ultraviolet to the infrared. And then, in that case, if you have grating, the heat transfer, even with metals, can be very high. This is why the geometry is important. Yes? So, I, I learned during your program, I believe that there are successful models or theoretical models that violate causality. Is that true? Or? You are speaking about non-reciprocal uh, objects, well, where the time reversal is broken. Uh, no, I do not know. Uh, no, no, I, I never heard about this violation of causality. Okay, so uh, I'm asking a different question. So what you presented was a sort of, it indicates that the, the fundamental theory is at hand, right? If you have the epsilons, you know what to calculate. So what, what do you see as the, the sort of the remaining puzzle? I mean, obviously there's really interesting sure. probes and materials. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. <clears throat> so this theodolicious theory is, uh, a comp is very good theory, is complete, but has some limitations, okay? The first limitation is when you use this out of thermal equilibrium, as I told you before, you assume that locally the two objects are at two different temperatures everywhere locally, okay? This, this, this uh, assumption is very good if you have a mechanism, thermalization mechanism, which is very effective, like the phonons. Phonons, they rapidly thermalize. But when the two objects are very close, are at a distance of few nanometers, even if you have phonons, you, can have, you cannot assume that the two temperatures are exactly the same. And the fluctuation in this object can be correlated to the fluctuation in the other object. And this is completely not taken into account in this uh, theory. And one big part of our program was to keep here expert from, of uh, ab initio theory, which they are able okay, to calculate this uh, correlation of fluctuation between the two. So to go in well beyond this Lifshitz theory when the separation is very small. And by the way, in heat transfer experiments, it is the case. They work at very, very small difference. And we have two kinds of experiments which are completely incompatible the one with the other. So if we have an experimental or theory problem. So there are experiments which are in agreement with the given theory and other which are completely off the theory. And so the idea is to see if this correlation can play a role or not. This is a big fundamental issue. Okay? This is one. Uh, there are other, other issues, but okay, this is one. The other one in Casimir effect is about this 
plasma or through the model. So in, this is in trans. In, in Casimir effect, there is a big problem. Um, uh, if you use this theory, you need epsilon. And epsilon for metals is the typically used to do the one, okay? And do they take losses inside. It's one minus omega p square divided omega square minus i gamma, which are those omega. You do this calculation, you put, you put in the Lipschitz theory, you compare with the experiment, they do not agree. They do not agree. And people did, okay, what if I put losses equal to zero? Of course, you cannot, you have losses, you cannot avoid losses, okay? But if you put losses equal to zero, you do the, the calculation of Lipschitz, you take an exact agreement with the experiment. I repeat, if you take a model which no one trusts, uh, which cannot be valid everywhere, which is the plasma model, without, the one without losses, agree with the experiment. If you take the real physical model, do not agree. And this is a problem which stands from maybe 10 years or 20 years in the communities, in our community, and we won't solve this problem at the moment. So this is another big, big fundamental problem in Casimir physics. Thank you. Great. Great.